the wife of Beth's prologue functions as a kind of confession, but not a repentant one. It is a defiant declaration of her own power. And it reveals a side of uh, a characteristic of women in the Middle Ages that was largely missing from the literature of the time. The, uh, <clears throat> she is in, in some ways a rejection of everything that comes before her in terms of culture. And she reacts against that culture in very dramatic ways. Uh, she initiates her prologue. With this, it's a long introduction to the story that she's going to tell. This, uh, the prologue is essentially uh, twice the length of the story. And it, uh, it, it's remarkable just for the sheer girth of it and the breadth of it. The... Uh, <laughs> In this moment where she is allowed to speak explicitly for herself, she doesn't just throw it away. She doesn't just say, hi, my name is, and I'm going to tell a story and then leap into the story for you to make of that what you will. She demands that sort of authority, that authorial role. She wants you to know who she is. This is her moment in the spotlight. She's not going to waste it. And her role as uh, the woman in this group is quite remarkable. Aside from the, uh, the, uh, the nuns, the religious figures, she is the voice of the ordinary woman. And she bears a lot of weight for that. And she seems to understand that significance. <laughs> And she's a lot of fun. She is really, really a lot of fun because she is so uh, over the top human. She demands recognition of that as much as anything. Her role as a human being, her identity as a human being, her privileges and rights as a human being, irrespective of gender. And she makes she she declares this, as I said, in uh, in stark opposition to the culture that had built up throughout the Middle Ages, where uh, lots of primarily religiously themed uh, work had painted women as somewhat uh, evil. There were essentially two kinds of women. There were the ideal. And then there was the harlot, the troublesome woman, the, uh, the virginal ideal based on Mary, the troublesome woman based on everybody else, primarily uh, prostitutes. These are the Madonna whore uh, dichotomies run amok. And she, having grown up through that, she is now fairly you know, along in years, uh, middle age, certainly. Uh, and she is uh, declaring that, okay, everything that you have learned, all the books you have read are worthless. She starts this from the very first word of her prologue. Experience. Though no authority were in this world is right enough for me to speak in the woe that is in marriage. Experience, not what you have been told. Not what tradition or custom or culture has handed down to you, but what you looking around, or in this case, her looking around, she looking around, can puzzle out for herself. The conclusions she can draw empirically based on her experience. And her topic is primarily marriage. Uh, this is what she claims to have some expertise in. And I think anybody could grant that she was because she claims fairly quickly that she was married by the, uh, by the age of 12. Fairly conventional for that time, apparently. But uh, she very quickly went through a succession. Well, not necessarily so quickly. It's a little, never very clear on the timelines. She went through five husbands. And now she's 
still a widower, and she says, very frankly, she will, uh, eh, she wouldn't mind picking up another. She kind of revels in that uh, uh, lustiness. She loves her physicality. She loves sexuality. She is very frank about sometimes she marries uh, men for her uh, for their money. Um, but she does take some joy in physicality. She doesn't mind using sex for uh, just you know. Okay, fine. Do what you got to do. I gotta, you know. This pays the bills. But. Uh, she has a sense of herself. Now, some of this comes across in little hidden innuendos here and there uh, of uh, the wife of Beth being a bit of a wayward woman herself. There are numerous references throughout of her walking, sometimes in the evenings, from house to house sometimes. And that is all... Uh, somewhat coded language uh, for prostitution. Prostitution, street walkers, quite literally. Uh, she, there is a question of how much liberty she has sometimes while she is married and uh, she, uh, she demands the freedom to walk, to go out. She particularly chafes uh, at husbands who try and restrict her, who try and hold her in, who try and contain her, control her. And you can think back to, you know, Thousand and One Nights, the, the great frame tale forebear of, of, this, uh, of this whole work, where a woman who is being constrained, who is being limited, is dangerous because you cannot constrain that you cannot limit that sort of energy that sort of uh passion needs to find some expression and women are always placed in that role of being very passionate so they are um the husbands come and go the uh she is not particularly sentimental about any of them uh she, uh, <laughs> in, in describing uh, one of her husbands, uh, some three of them were good and two were bad. The three who were, go who were good men were rich and old. <laughs> and so they barely could the statute hold. Through which they all had bound themselves to me. By God, you know what I mean, certainly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so help me God, I laugh to remember. To remember, She loves to laugh. She's very, you know, she has a great joie de vivre, as the French would say. How pitifully at night I made them labor. Oh, come on. That just, you know. They're old guys. You got to give them a little bit of time, a little bit of relaxation. You can't expect too much. And, but, you know, she demands it. And the fact that she demands it and that she's so frank in talking about it is uh, funny. It is a little shocking, uh, certainly to an audience of that time, perhaps. But it is also a declaration that she will not be repressed. She will not be constrained. She insists on the ability to express herself. And this becomes quite charming after a while. Uh, she, um, she is a very lusty and inarguably irrepressibly human person. And she just recognizes this. She is not an ideal. She doesn't want to be. Um... Do, 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 do. Each of them was eager, as I saw, to bring me home some gay things from the fair. They were glad when my speech to them was fair. I scolded them, God knows, spitefully. Uh, she seems to relish this role of sitting at home and waiting for the husbands to come home and bring, bring her presents. And she... You can imagine her just sitting there and judging the presence and saying, eh, that's it. Look kind of cheesy, kind of cheap. Uh, you know, you could have done better. 
that's a power role. That is a exercise in power. And through all of this, we are reminded continually of how little power she has as a woman, as a wife. And she is always wrestling for some sense of power, some sense of authority that she, uh, she has control over her life, over her identity. Uh, now, listen how I acted properly, you wise wives, who can so well understand. Thus should you accuse falsely out of hand, for half so boldly knows no living man how to swear and lie as just a woman can. How to swear and lie. She is reveling in her own, uh, let's say, crassness, in her own sinning. And she is owning that. But is that, is that, well, imagine the, uh, the portrayal, because this is Chaucer as a man writing in the voice of a woman. And is this sexist or is this empowering? Is he saying, you know, if you just let women be who they are instead of just always watching them, you let them get just a little bit of authority and they're going to revel in their own, you know, deceitfulness and their own inherent evil. Or... Is it empowering to let a woman own that, That say to say, okay, uh, yeah, uh, I am going to swear and lie from time to time. We all do. We're human beings. We are, as women, human beings also. You can't deny us that. You can't put us on the pedestal. We will insist on being recognized for our humanity. Um... You say, uh, you say some folk want us for our richness, some for our figure, some for our fairness, some because you can either sing or dance, some for gentility and socializing. Uh, she just gets irritated. You can see with the idea of woman as a commodity, as being valued for one thing or the other, these exterior uh, skills or attributes that they might have that they're not on sale. She, she, she takes great outrage at this great umbrage and she is uh she has no patience for that sort of role um you say also that it displeases me unless you will always praise my beauty she has no you know she she dismisses this uh out of hand um old barrel full of lies all this you say uh she's just contemptuous of dismissing of flattery it's like you know don't don't give me that that's just more words and words words don't really do much for her experience does words are what come down to us in the form of books that codify exactly how evil women are but actions experience that tells a different story um she uh yeah. You will not, though it might make you crazy, be master of both my goods and my body. Talking about the, uh, the once, a, once a husband and wife are married, the husband owns all of her property. Uh, women have no inherent legal rights. And she is just outraged at this. And she doesn't mind saying, you can't be a master of both my, my, my goods, my property, and my body. Uh, you know, you, you're giving her nothing, and she's rejecting that. Um, da, 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 One of them you'll forgo to spite your eyes. What good is it to ask around and spy? I think you want to lock me in your chest. She wants, uh, she wants a little bit of freedom of liberty. She wants to be able to walk around. Her husband is too controlling, doesn't want her going around from house to house, walking, Again, a little bit uncertain there, but he doesn't want her to leave the house at all. He doesn't want her, I forget which husband this is, but he wants to control her and doesn't want to have a life of her own, an identity of her own. And so he says, you have to stay here. You should say, wife, go where you think is best. Enjoy yourself. I'll leave no tales of this. I know you are for... I know you for my own true wife, Dame Alice. Alice is her name, and some in another area it's Allison. Uh, it's just that's where we find out her name. 
We love no man who will take heed or charge of where we go. We want to be at large. And just think about that. And the character, particularly of honestly, the uh, the entire English nation and the character and the, the emphasis that the English have historically placed on liberty, personal individual liberty. Um, she needs the trust of her husband and the accommodation of her natural freedom as a human being to come and go to a degree as she pleases. Do not repress her desires. She, uh, she calls out misogyny quite frequently. She calls out uh, uh, the unfairness of the, uh, the institution marriage how the power dynamic is inherently stacked against women. And she, um, she tells some harrowing tales, some shocking portraits of what um, marriage can be for her. She has a variety of experiences in that, obviously, but he, she, she dwells in on one, the fifth husband, uh, much younger than she is. Uh, he was uh, 20, I was 40, yeah, he's quite the cougar. And uh, he had, uh, was, it, was that the fifth, I don't know. Uh, he was a, a clerk at Hoxford. He was a young intellectual, a student. Um, and, um, ba, 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 ba. they, uh, get involved, let's say a little nefarious. We don't need to go into all of it, but at a certain point, uh, well, he likes to stay home and read. He likes to read. He is a intellectual, a scholar, and the, uh, the reading material that he prefers is a large book that is apparently an anthology of, uh, it's, it's an anthology of sexism and misogyny. And it gathers together all these stories, the underlying theme of which all these stories handed down from uh, uh, classical and Christian tradition, uh, the theme of which are all women are bad. You can't trust women. Marriage is torture. Um, you've got to keep them down. Um, and apparently in one evening she uh she tore a page out and he reacted by god he hit me once upon the ear because out of his book a leaf i rent and from that stroke my ear all deaf then went but I, like a lioness, I was stubborn, and with my tongue I was a jangler, chatterer born, and I would walk around as, uh, and I would walk, would walk around as I once did from house to house, although he did forbid. Again, she's challenging him with this notion of freedom. She will not be uh, jailed. She will not be repressed. Um, with again, however, that little notion of, well, you know, walk around. Is that a hint of prostitution? Not entirely sure. The, uh, she, that's how she paints it at the beginning that she took, that he was reading and she gives a long list of the stories and whatever that he was reading. Uh, and she bemoans that, you know, by God, if women had written stories like clerks do, within their oratories, they would have written of men more wretchedness than all the mark of Adam could redress. So she's saying, you know, why isn't there a, a female voice of authorship here? Why, well, why are we always the victim? If women would write, maybe we would have fuller representation on the page and we would not be just, uh, you know, always the troublesome women. The, um, The incident, however, comes out that uh, it, it wasn't as 
simple as she first laid out that she got irritated that he was reading tore the page out of the book and he hit her in uh uh out of a reaction to that later on around line 790 and when i saw he never would refrain from reading on this cursed book all night then suddenly three leaves i have ripped right out of the book as he read and also with my fist i took him on the cheek so that backwards in our fire, right down fell he. Uh, she hit him first. She didn't just rip the page. She left out that little detail earlier on, but now, oh, that changes the story a little, does it? I don't know. It's significant in the judging of domestic abuse, which is what we're talking about here. She hit him first. He hit her following that. So maybe he wasn't hitting her just for ripping the book, but also for, let's face it, uh, giving him a, giving him a cold cock right across the, uh, right across the cheek, just smacking him out of nowhere. He wasn't expecting it. So, and fairly, he knelt down when he came near and he said, Allison, my sweet sister, dear, never more will I hit you in God's name. If I've done so, you are your, you are yourself to blame. I pl pray you your forgiveness. Now I seek which is an interesting apology on a lot of levels. On the one hand, he seems genuinely upset and panicked, like he lost his temper and he recognizes that fact immediately. And, oh my God, what did I do? Uh, on the other hand, he does toss a little blame her way and say, well, you provoked me. That's not accepting full responsibility. It's a uh, remarkably nuanced interpretation of the interaction at this point. But the remorse that he feels, I think, is genuine because they strike a new agreement. They settle this balance of power a little more fairly from here. We two fell into an agreement there. He gave me all the bridle in my hand to have the governing of our house and land and of his tongue and of his hands then too. I made him burn his book without ado. And when I had gotten back for me my, by mastery all the sovereignty, and when he said to me, my own true wife, do as you like the rest of all your life, keep your honor and keep my rank and state, after that day, we never had debate. Now, significantly, he says, you know, the governing of house and land. So presumably this is limited to their private sphere. It's not out in public and perhaps she has to be a little bit more courteous to him when they are talking when they are walking around in public in the public square perhaps they have come to after this altercation after this exchange of uh physical assaults they have struck an agreement in their words they have come to a conclusion they have uh arranged their lives according to themselves. Negotiating, uh, negotiating the authority based on themselves and their own individuality instead of just importing some prefab mold of the power structure of medieval England. They toss out the tradition. They toss out the incrustations of misogyny and sexism and patriarchy that had been handed down to them and had built up so much throughout the Middle Ages that it was suffering or it was suffocating her. Now, she has some power. How much? Only they know. You can't know because we are on the outside. We are not in that relationship. And that's what makes it all the more special because it's the two of them striking a deal between themselves based on individual authority and self-sovereignty from liberty, from the freedom to say, I want to arrange my life a certain way. She has, as a poor, older uh, uh, woman, uh, she has nothing except herself. And she demands recognition for that. 
in a way that is admirable, in a way that is somewhat uh, alarming, uh, in a way that is uh, funny. <laughs> She's not afraid to let it all hang out. And she is a remarkable and important voice within the broader Canterbury Tales for speaking just that truth, for bringing this very complicated, rich tapestry of diverse individuals and saying, all right, the poor, the woman, the older, we need recognition. We need to be heard. Don't take us for granted. We're part of this fabric that we call society. 